Okay, here we go with the lecture for chapter 17, the Quaternary Period. Um, this is the most recent period of Earth history. It's the last 2.6 million years of history. Uh, basically, it encompasses the Pleistocene and the Holocene period, uh, epochs. Uh, and it was a period of intense, or is isn't a period of intense glaciation. So, what's a glacier, first and foremost? Well, for those of you that took physical geology, you know that a glacier is a river, river of ice for all intents and purposes. So, basically, a glacier looks kind of like this. It has a zone of accumulation, which we'll talk about later. You get enough mass, the snow turns into ice. The ice will then flow under its own weight. Sort of like pancake batter will flow in a skillet under its own weight. Um, now, there are basically two types of glaciers that we recognize in geology. There are what we call the alpine or valley glaciers. These are glaciers that originate in mountain environments. They start in the head of a high alpine valley and they flow outwards from there. And then there are the continental glaciers. Continental glaciers tend to originate more in a high latitude area where you have a, a large snow field and then it, the ice spreads out in all directions from there. Now, all glaciers are going to be part of the hydrosphere because they are made of water, but they're also part of something that we call the cryosphere, basically because they're made of ice. And they kind of act as a reservoir. Um, when you look at all the water on the Earth, about 97.2% of all the water on the Earth is in the oceans. Therefore, it's without major treatment, it's undrinkable. 2.8% of all the water on the Earth is essentially fresh water. Of that, the vast majority of it is locked up in ice. Uh, the rest of it is either groundwater, is the second largest constituent, and then uh, roughly a, per a percent of what's not in the ice or not in the ground makes up all the water that's in the atmosphere, in organic organisms, in the ground, I mean, not the ground, in the rivers, in the lakes. So most of the water is either in ice or in the ground that we can use. Now, backing up to the end of the, uh, or the beginning of the Pleistocene and into the Holocene with the tectonics and the volcanism that we're continuing, the continent-to-continent -continent collision worldwide between India and Asia continues. It's still continuing today. It hasn't stopped. It's slowed down, but it hasn't stopped. Uh, the Himalaya Mountains are increasing in height somewhere over three feet a year, but they're also eroding close to three feet a year, so they're not rising up as fast as they had in the past. They're still rising. Uh, the subduction zone along the west coast of South America forms the Andes during this period of time, and activities forming the Aleutians, the Japanese archipelago, the Philippines, etc. also continue. In terms of North America volcanism, um, we see the Cascade Range of the North Pacific, um, or the Pacific Northwest, however you want to call it. That dates back to the Oligocene, but uh, the large composite volcanoes that we most commonly associate with that line of volcanoes today, namely things like Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, Mount Hood, Mount Shasta, um, those were all formed during the, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Um, we also have some prominent volcanic eruptions in other areas, such as the Yellowstone region. Um, several, three major eruptions of the Yellowstone region during this period of time. Uh, in northern Arizona, the area around Flagstaff, this, what's called the San Francisco Volcanic Field, as well as parts of Idaho, California, southern Arizona, and into New Mexico. Now, uh, the st stratigraphy of this time period, basically we look at 11,700 years ago to be the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary. And this corresponds to warmer conditions as glaciers and, and ice begins to melt. Uh, in fact, actually in the Pleistocene, the average temperature of the Earth was several degrees, maybe even as much as... Uh, eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today uh, at a minimum, and it could have been as much as 15 degrees hotter than it is today on average. Um, so it, 
goes to show that what we have experienced in the last 11,000 years is actually something that's a little unusual for the planet and that we've had this very low, rather cool planet, period. Um, terrestrially speaking, the Pleistocene glaciers got up to be three kilometers thick. So if you think about that, three kilometers is almost um, two miles almost two miles thick of ice so that's a lot of water that was locked up in the ice so that means that they covered about three times more land area today or somewhere around the neighborhood of 45 million square kilometers in North America um, we've identified that this ice advance has happened several times uh, in what we call stages worldwide and they're followed by these warmer periods or what we call interglacial stages or interglacial periods and that's actually what we find ourselves in climatically right now is we're in what's supposed to be an interglacial period and right now there are at least 14 known glacial stages uh, in the deep sea sediments it's interesting that the ocean sediments indicate a number of climatic fluctuations based on the species of planktonic foraminifera um, basically looking at species that thrive in warm water conditions versus species that thrive in cold water conditions and where they're found so you can actually kind of map out what the temperature ranges are on the earth at that period of time uh, you can also look at how they grow uh, some actually grow dependent on their temperature the way they they form, the way they coil. Um, some species, or one species, coils in a right-handed manner if it's in warm waters uh, that are warmer than 10 degrees centigrade, and left-handedly if it's in waters that are below between 8 and 10 degrees centigrade. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the temperature of the water is. Another way we can look at this is what's oxygen-16 to oxygen-18 isotopic ratios. Um, it turns out that oxygen-16, because it's got two fewer neutrons than oxygen-18, hence the number, evaporates easier than, uh, or water containing oxygen-16 evaporates easier than water containing oxygen-18. So the higher the temperature, we can actually map what the percentage of oxygen-16 to oxygen-18 is and kind of rough out the temperature ranges of the Earth at that time. So. The more oxygen 18 there is, the more preferential we warm we will probably tend to be. Now, the onset of glaciation on the Earth, at least for this current period, I mean, we do have record of glaciation going back billions of years, but the current period of glaciation um, seems to have started about 40 million years ago, more or less. Um, but the period between 2.6 million years ago to today is what we know the best and where we see actually the vast majority of that activity. Contrary to pop culture, um, the Earth is not much colder during glacial advances. And in fact, it's actually probably colder now than some periods of glacial stages actually were. This has to do with the fact of what is required to make a glacier. Um, a cooling earth reduces evaporation. In order to build a glacier, you need lots of snowfall in a relatively short period of time. And that snowfall has to occur in an area where it's not going to melt completely year after year after year. So if you decrease the temperature of the earth, you actually decrease the rate of precipitation because you decrease the rate of evaporation, you also decrease the amount of moisture that can be holding the air, and that makes it harder to actually grow a glacier. It's a bit of thermodynamic physics, but it works. So, let's think about how a glacier forms. I've already mentioned part of it. First and foremost, we need an area where we do not have all of the snow melt year-round. So we have to have an area where some degree of snow is going to be left on the ground all year round. Okay. Now, this can create what we call a snow field or a snow pack. 
Now, in some areas, it's easy to predict where this is going to be. We can look at what's called the snow line. The snow line is an elevation above sea level that can be determined based on your latitude um, about how far above sea level you have to be in order for snow to remain on the ground year round. Uh, if you go to Africa, you can go to the top of Kilimanjaro, uh, which is a rather large volcano in Africa, and it's more than 14,000 feet high, and somewhere above that 14,000 foot mark is where you hit the snow line. You go northwards to areas such as about 70, 65, 70 degrees north latitude, and that snow line is down to about 1,000 feet above sea level, or lower. So it really depends on where you're at. And that has to do with the amount of solar energy that's being received and how the solar energy is coming into the Earth, how at the equator or near the equatorial regions from the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer, how at least during once or twice a year, the sun rays are hitting the land perpendicularly, whereas because the Earth is a globe and... Uh, there we go. So, equator, sun hit, light hits perpendicular, but because the sunlight is parallel, when you get up here near the poles, it's kind of a glancing blow. So the density of solar radiation is actually higher in the equatorial regions than the density is at the polar regions. Therefore, the equatorial regions are warmer, the polar regions are colder. And that's why we get the difference in the snow line. <clears throat> now, in order to form the glacier, we have to have that snowpack. And year after year after year after year of accumulation, uh, to the point where we need to get the snow deep enough that we start seeing the compaction of the crystals of snow. And that actually causes a change in the shape and the morphology of those crystals. So what happens is the snow will recrystallize into these granular shapes that we call fern, F-I-R-N. Then that fern will slowly compact into solid crystal and ice. Now, in order to do that, you need somewhere between 40 and 50 meters of snow, about 150 feet of snow piled up. Um, at that depth, we finally get the, the crystallization and air is pushed out. It's also about the depth you need to get to in order for the ice to be able to have enough weight in it to be able to start moving plastically. So kind of think like a silly putty or a clay, but moving much slower. Um, then we can have the two you know, different zones in a glacier. There's a point in the glacier where anything that falls on the glacier above that is accumulating. We call it the zone of accumulation because it's above the snow line for all intents and purposes. Below that point is the zone of wastage. That's where the glacier is wasting away through melting or pieces breaking off, which we call calving. Um, and then also within the glacier itself, you have this, the top section of it is brittle and the bottom section of it is plastic. And it's about 150 meter depth into the ice that creates that. Now, as far as the effects of glaciation, glaciers are, for all intents and purposes, giant, slow-moving bulldozers. They literally plow the ground in front of them. Um, if you've ever used a shovel to scrape up sand off of a driveway or off of a porch, or if you've ever been lucky enough to have to shovel snow, it's kind of the same effect. The glacier just pushes in front and everything piles up in front of it. And it just scrapes over the land. So it will scrape over the land. It will greatly reshape the topography. Um, in the northern U.S. and much of Canada was eroded by a glacier. In fact, they have very thin soils in some areas because most of that soil material was pushed off and pushed southwards. Um, there are areas where you know the topography is flattened. It's very subdued because of this process. You have areas of exposed rock that are at one and the same time scratched and polished. Um, they're scratched because glaciers have rock embedded in them, but they're polished because the, some of that rock gets ground down into what we call rock flour, very, very fine grain material. If you've ever worked at doing any sort of metal work or woodworking, um, one of the ways you make metal shiny or wood shiny is you sand it with progressively finer and finer grit. The finer the grit, the smoother the surface you create. And if you go to a fine enough grit, you actually create a polished surface. 
So that's what happened to the rocks, is they were essentially polished by the glaciers. Um, you can see this in places like New York City in um, Central Park, where there are actually these large outcrops of the bedrock that are have these gouges in them. It look like somebody took things anywhere from the size of your finger to the size of a bowling ball and just gouged it through the rock. And then the surfaces are polished, where if you get the right angle, you actually get a reflection off of, off of stuff, from bright lights at least. Um, it also can gouge out the land. So in parts of New York, we have, have uh, these features called the Finger Lakes. And these are areas where the glaciers just dug out the land and created these long gouges that then when the glaciers melted, they filled back in with water and it created the lakes. Now, when it comes to the alpine glaciers, they have tremendous shaping abilities on the land. They can take a stream valley, and most stream valleys in a mountain are V-shaped and they can turn it into a U-shape. So a U-shaped valley is indicative of a valley that was formed by a glacier or carved out by a glacier. Um, and then you have the sedimentation at the end and uh, below creating what are called moraines. And those have a lot of interesting features to them. We can tell a lot of stuff about climates from them uh, and as well as how the glaciers advanced and retreated during their time. Now, of course, when you have that much ice as you did during the ice ages, sea level is going to be affected because for all intents and purposes, the amount of water on the earth is steady state. So if you want to create more glaciers, you've got to take water out of the oceans. So today we see somewhere between 28 to 35 million cubic uh, kilometers of water that is frozen into the glaciers and the ice caps. At the maximum during the Pleistocene, at least 70 million cubic kilometers or more as much or as much as 120 million cubic kilometers of water were frozen in the sea level or frozen into the ice. And this would have dropped sea level as much as 130 meters or about 400 feet. So, one of the things that I've always hypothesized is that if sea level during the height of the glaciers was as much as 400 feet lower, given how often humans would live in coastal areas and travel on coastal areas, how much of our history is buried under the ocean right now, under sea, in these areas that we didn't think about looking at because... We didn't know they were above sea level at one point. It might explain how you have remains that have been found in North America and South America that predate the accepted idea that humans first came to this continent about 18,000 years ago over the Bering Strait land bridge. Uh, the, it, one of the issues that we you find with that is that there are caves in South America that have remains in them that appear to be fire pits. And those fire pits, the charcoal in them dates back to 30,000 years ago. That's a lot, that's human occupation, more than almost double what, what is accepted. Or um, how it, the, um, in New Mexico, the, there were these arrowheads and spear points that were found and the name is escaping me at the moment so I'll probably remember it in a moment but um, these arrowheads were thought to have come from Asia but nothing technologically similar to them are found in Asia in fact the archaeological finds of those spear points and arrowheads actually shows that they get more and more primitive or simpler if you will the further east you go, and they also get older, with the oldest ones being found around 20, 25,000 years ago on the east coast of the U.S. And then the most similar of the arrowheads and spear points outside of the Americas are from southern France. So the technology somehow went over the Atlantic, not through the through Asia. It, you don't find that style of tool making outside of Europe, out of, especially Southern Europe. So how did it get here? 
especially since the ones that they find in North America are even more advanced than the ones they find in southern France. Um, so that the drop of sea level really could have changed the way our ancestors moved, as well as the way different animals moved. For example, wolves originated from a species in Asia. And until the Ice Age, they didn't... Uh, until the Ice Ages really kicked in, they didn't really exist in the Americas. The terror birds held sway, as we'll see later on, and it was the introduction of the wolves coming over probably through a land bridge that changed that ecosystem. Now, there's a feature in geology, uh, an idea that we call isostasy. Isostasy basically is the idea that the crust of the earth is floating on the mantle. Uh, kind of like ice floating in your drink. If you measure down to a constant elevation in the mantle, the idea is that if you take a column, that every column you take, as long as it's the same area, will have the same amount of mass in it. So the only thing that varies is the density of the rocks and the density of the material. And this helps explain why when you erode mountains, they still rise up. So the Appalachians, some of the rocks that we see in the Appalachians formed or were formed tens of miles deep, but now they're near the surface. So these rocks had to have been risen up as the Appalachians are wearing down. This also explains why the Rocky Mountains are still rising up today, even though there's no tectonic forces pushing them up. They're rising up as they erode. In fact, they're rising up almost as, about as fast as they are eroding, maybe just a little bit slower. So this is a great thing that we can use because one of the things that this means is that in a glacial period, when you have this three kilometers of ice sitting on the land, that's going to push the land down. And we actually see that in the areas around the Great Lakes. So that added mass from the glaciers causes depression of the ground and then as that after that mass has gone away the ground is rebounding so we see that actually around the great lakes right now now speaking of lakes glaciers can create two types of lakes there are pluvial lakes which are uh, present in the areas that are now arid but they were leftovers from the meltwater of glaciation. So the best one I can think of off the top of my head is the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake is the remnants of a pluvial lake that was called Lake Bonneville. It, was, it existed during the height of the glacial period. It covered Utah, part of Colorado, part of, uh, parts of um, Idaho, Montana, it was just a very, very large lake. The Great Salt Flats, or the Bonneville Salt Flats, are what remain of this lake, and the Great Salt Lake is the remnants of it. As all that water has melted, it's left all that salt that it had in it behind. If you take it to the extent where it was fresh water, it was huge. Um, I think, yeah, Idaho, Nevada, there it is. So let's see if I can get in there. There's Lake Bonneville right there. So actually, Idaho, I was to correct myself, Idaho, Utah, maybe a little bit into Nevada, maybe a little bit into the part of Nebraska, I think that is. Or is that... Yeah, I think that's part of it. But anyway, very large lake. You can see the difference between the Great Salt Lake right there and the totality of Lake Bonneville. Um, there are a lot of lakes like this. Uh, actually, same thing in Death Valley. Uh, the salt flats in Death Valley are the remnants of a lake. In fact, actually, one of the funny things about Death Valley, or one of the curious things about Death Valley, is along the shorelines of the ancient lake, we find lots and lots of evidence of human occupation. Uh, stone tools, pottery shards, and whatnot. The one thing they've never found is the remains of the village. They've never found where the occupation occurred. And what makes it interesting and kind of scary uh, is that there is a spot where there was a massive landslide back when that lake still existed. Uh, a large chunk of rock 
probably something several times larger than the um, the area of Nogales High School broke off the mountains and slammed down into the ground. There's some people who hypothesize that the village is under that rock. So, um, gives you an idea of what, another reason why we study geology. Now, the other type of lake that, that glaciers will tend to form are what we call proglacial lakes. These are lakes that are going to be formed when the glaciers melt. Um, these are deposits that show things like varves, and what varves are, think about the rings in a tree, you know, the growth rings in a tree, varves are very similar, where you have a thick layer followed by a thin, darker layer. And what that represents is periods of time when the glacier, was, when the lake was melted, or the surface of the lake was melted, so the water is getting agitated and moved by the wind and, and thermal processes, so you get a thicker layer of sediment that lays down and then in the winter when the when the lake ices over completely the water stills and you get this very fine layer that comes on top of it and so you can actually count cycles on that and that's what we call varves they're alternating dark and light layers similar to tree rings and they show basically warm season to cold season uh, we can see drop stones. These are, you know, like I said, glaciers carry lots of things. They carry rocks, and they can just carry rocks out into the middle of the lake or into the ocean. And then once that rock melts out, it drops down. It hits the soft sediments and plunges into them, creating very distinctive structures when they melt. Um, lake Missoula and Lake Columbia would uh, were lakes that formed in the northwest that were actually created by the fingers of a glacier basically acting like a dam. And every once in a while, those dams would break and send a massive wave of water downstream um, and create uh, very large features uh, for flood events. So in eastern Washington, there are what we call the scab lands. In fact, there are uh, features there that look very much to be like ripple marks that you see in in uh, f flowing streams. But these ripple marks are like 100 feet high. <laughs> they have boulders in them that are the size of a small car. Um, so these things were obviously large amounts of water that were coming down through the system. And we have uh, giant fluvial features that are seen not only in Washington, but is also in Idaho and Montana. Um, Lake Bonneville, going back to it, at its extent was roughly 50,000 square kilometers in area and up to 335 meters deep, so 1,000 feet deep. Now it's right up to the Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake and the Bonneville Salt Flats. Um, the Great Lakes are actually deeply eroded and depressed by the glaciers, and they only exist because of the glaciers. In fact, the, gla the Great Lakes are slowly shrinking away as the ground under them rebounds. Uh, so what caused the Pleistocene glaciation? There are a lot of factors that go into this. Um, causing an ice age is not a simple matter of making the Earth colder. As I already mentioned, if you make the Earth colder, you are counteractively uh, affecting precipitation to the point where you're not going to get the precipitation you need to create the glaciers in the first place. But we do know that there are certain cycles that do seem to line up with the periods of glaciation in the Earth that we have seen and that do seem to have some degree of effect on whether or not we are glaciers. So these cycles are basically been coined the Milankovic cycles. Um, we think these cycles add together to actually create the glacial periods, in part at least. Uh, the first of these is the orbital eccentricity. If you look at the orbit of the Earth, most people think the orbit of the Earth is circular. Here's the sun, and the Earth goes around like this. That's not quite true. The orbit of the Earth is more elliptical, more oval-shaped, and the sun sits off-center. The, the uh, eccentricity of that orbit, how elliptical it is, changes over a period of about 100,000 years, going from more circular 
to more oval shaped or less circular. Um, the less, the more circular periods tend to be periods where the climate is warmer and more stable. The less circular ones, the Earth is spending more time further out away from the sun, and so it tends to get cooler. We also have the change in the tilt of the Earth. If you look at the way the Earth is spinning, <clears throat> let's just use this as the as nor the North Pole in the equator. If this was the plane of the of the uh, ecliptic, which is the plane the, the plane from the sun, uh, the Earth is actually tilted about 23, uh, 23 and a half degrees right now. Now, the moon kind of stabilizes this tilt a little bit, but it still wobbles. It still wobbles back and forth. And that changes from about 23 degrees is what we think is the, the minimum to about 24 and a half degrees as a maximum. But that wobble takes place over about 40,000 years. And then there's also the precession of the equinox. Um, if you've ever taken a top and you've spun a top, when the top gets slow, it starts to do this number where it's the top end of it is kind of process, what we call processing as it's spinning around. Well, the Earth actually does that too. The Earth is processing. And so if you, the way we can see this is by looking at the stars. Um, right now, if you look at the night sky, there's a point in the sky to the north that we call the North Star. If you take a long time-lapse exposure of, this, of the night sky, you see the stars creating these trails, these arcs, and the closer you get to the the the, the uh, northern point in the sky, the more circular those arcs are, um, or more completely circular they are. But there's a star that doesn't move in the center of that, and that's called the North Star. Well, about 13,000 years ago, it was a different star. And so it's wobbling at about a 26,000 year cycle. So if we add these cycles together um, and look at what their potential impact is on the climate, they tend to line up fairly closely to the points that we're seeing glaciation in Earth's recent history. Now, this doesn't mean that those are the only things that can have an effect. There are some other things. Solar output can have an effect. If, if you get sudden changes in solar output, solar maximum, solar minimums, that can have an impact. Changes in ocean circulation can really affect this. Um, the most current ice age seems to, a uh, set of ice ages, seem to have some degree of connection to the growth of the Isthmus of Panama, which is a volcanic region that connected North and South America before those volcanoes grew up and basically sealed off that, uh, or sealed in that connection, warm waters from the Atlantic would spill into the Pacific, meaning that the equatorial regions of the Earth would be a little warmer and the polar regions would actually be colder. The continents can move and change and change the flow of the oceans. And with the oceans being the great conveyor belts moving heat around, that can have an effect. And then volcanic eruptions, large-scale volcanic eruptions can really mess with the climate. Um, Mount St. Helens was a fairly large eruption, but it didn't really have that big of an effect. Uh, about a decade, maybe a decade and a half later, you had Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupt. When Mount Pinatubo erupted, it erupted a volume about 15 times the size of Mount St. Helens. So it was about 15 times larger. The next year, the average temperature of the Earth dropped by one degree for a year, just because of that one eruption. And that was, relatively speaking, in consideration of the history of the Earth, a relatively small volcanic eruption. Mounts, uh, Mount, Saint, Mount Vesuvius may have been a little bit larger. Uh, Krakatoa is much larger. There are a couple of volcanoes in uh, Mount Tambora, is one that has erupted, and uh, I believe it's Mount Tambor is one, one of the ones that erupted in the 1800s, and basically the year afterwards was considered to be the year without a summer. Um, there was snow and ice in London, England in July. So volcanoes can have a short burst effect on us. 
but when we start getting into the super volcanoes, those could have a lasting effect, maybe lasting a, a year, a couple of years, maybe a decade, and that could be enough to actually kickstart a climatic change. So, but that's uh, chapter 17 in a nutshell. Um, we'll talk chapters 18 and 19 this next week. Be done with it. Just remember, um, starting the week after Thanksgiving is when your papers and presentations are due. And then on the third, we'll have our, I believe it's the third. Uh, yes, the third. On the third will be the lab final. And on the 10th will be the class final. So see you guys later.